Hi, my name is Roberta Carvalho and I'm the staff scientist at the Westport River Watershed Alliance. In simple scientific terms, a watershed is a land area that is topographically high enough to drain into a single river basin. So in our community, our watershed is 100 square miles and it encompasses several towns being Westport, Dartmouth, Fall River, Freetown, and in Rhode Island, Little Compton and Tiverton. I'm Jenny O'Neill. I'm the executive director of the Westport Historical Society. The head of Westport, of course, has its own special story. It's one of the earlier settlements. About half a mile before you get to the head, the river begins to drop, and it apparently drops about 40 feet until you get to the head. And that, of course, creates the opportunity for water power and, of course, for mills. And that is really the start of a lot of activity beginning here at the head. For the next 50 years, tremendous amount of activity going on on the landing. We know that they built about five whaling ships here at the head. They varied in size up to about 300 tons, up to about 100 feet. Westport grew up around the two branches of the river and evolved and developed because of the existence of the rivers and its history is bound up in water power, with shipbuilding, with all of the maritime activities that go along with living by such a, a beautiful and powerful waterway. We are very fortunate here in our watershed area that unlike our neighbors, Westport had a very agricultural past. Our neighbors in Fall River and New Bedford had an industrial past, so they're dealing with pollutants like PCBs and industrial type things that are terrible because they linger long in the environment and don't go away. In Westport, because of our agricultural past, we don't have those sorts of pollutants around. So what we're dealing with more is nutrients. Nutrients come from our wastewater, domestic animals, but also similarly to the sources of nutrients, we also deal with pathogens, which is a fancy word for germs. The nutrient of concern that we're dealing with in our river is nitrogen. After the third aid hurricane, summer cottages sprung up up and down the river. And uh, they were really one or two room cottages. And I can remember in my own case, the septic system was two 55 gallon drums right near the river and uh, you can guess how effective that was. But it worked as far as the owner was concerned. My grandparents had a house on Hosnick, got wiped out in the 38. So they moved up the river and they bought a piece of land. I was probably maybe 12 to 14. It was bushes, we cut the bushes down and the whole water frontage had been a dump. It was full of rusty cans because back then, where do you put something you want to get rid of? You dump it over the bank into the river. That philosophy was used in a number of places. And we were culprits of it too, but being a young kid, I had to get the wheelbarrow and clean it all out. In the early 2000s, there was still a lot of commercial agriculture happening, more so than now, dairy farms and whatnot. And even back when I first started, there was an animal feedlot operation. These operations were pretty close to the river and you would see when it rained their direct input of pollutants into the river and these streams. There are several significant brooks in Westport. No matter where you live in our watershed, in our drainage basin, what you do on your land can affect what happens in these brooks and eventually the river. The activities that are affecting water quality in the river are tied to development and land use. In the early 90s, several board members and volunteers we're very concerned about pathogen levels in the river due to this feedlot operation. And so they started their own laboratory and did fecal coliform counts to look at bacteria levels in the river related to this feedlot operation. And from that program in the early 90s, it morphed into the program that we have today that is certified by the state. We have to develop this whole quality assurance project plan submitted to the state and it describes our sampling of pathogens for the Westport River. So in the summertime we go out once a week, we monitor 11 spots on the river itself and then we come and check the streams at eight different locations and bring the samples to a laboratory that's certified by the state and they give us back the results the next day. We post them on our website. It tells you whether or not the river is safe enough to swim in or boat in as determined by the state. In the summer we also test nutrient levels 
in the river and we do that four times a summer. Our goal is to have a swimmable, shellfishable river. Indeed, we have seen great improvements in water quality, especially in streams and parts of the river that were proximal to these operations. But again, there's still a lot of work to do because when it does rain, we, we still see pollutant levels that are too high for recreational activities. We are one of the only groups in the area that are monitoring the river on a routine basis and have been for years. I spent, I would say, from the time I was seven to the time I was about 18, I was on the river constantly. Uh, we were down here constantly. The things the river had to offer, the fishing, the swimming, the boating, it was a lifeblood. It was an active, bustling little port. The river is a fairly shallow estuary in most places, and you see a lot of personal watercraft jet skis, you know, going in places that no one ever disturbed years and years ago. And it affects not just what's under the water, but what's on top of the water. Those are the kind of things I think people aren't aware of that what kind of activities affect other things. I mean, there used to be floats of eelgrass through here that you had to clear your motor on a regular basis on any given change in tides. And you look out here now, you know, you barely see any eelgrass. You know, some call it just progress. I don't know if there's a, it's a cumulative effect of many different things. I don't think you can point to one thing. I mean, some things you can control, some things you can't. My name is Gay Gillespie. I'm the former director here at the Westport River Watershed Alliance, as well as a longtime volunteer and committed member of the organization. The Watershed Alliance was started by a group of concerned citizens who were hearing about a proposed sewage lagoon on the banks of the Upper East Branch of the Westport River. So this group of people got together, pooled some resources, and hired a lawyer to work with the town to fight the case, and they won and it was the beginning of what was known as the Westport River Defense Fund. I came on board soon thereafter, which was in 1988. Came in doing volunteer work, building membership and development, running River Day, and eventually I was named executive director at one of the annual meetings. Over the course of the years that I was here, there were numerous issues of pollution problems to the river. We decided, working with the town, that we would try to apply for state monies to make some corrections. And one of the projects was this project right here behind me, which was the first constructed wetland that was done here in Westport. And the reason this was important is that the head is very narrow and channeled up here to the river, and being able to start cleaning up the problems at the top of the river made more sense than starting it with problems down at the bottom of the river. The whole project was completed here in 2005 and we saw significant improvement in water quality over the course of time. In the meanwhile, more project work was started to see what we could do on the west side of the Westport River over here and we realized with engineering studies that over 50% of the stormwater coming down the road was being contributed by the school property and the library we got another grant to collect the stormwater on the school property with these really beautiful rain gardens that were planted going up the drive to the school. I think what people need to understand is that you cannot clean up something unless you've got multiple years of data collection. You can't just monitor for one summer and say, I've got the answer, I've got the problem all figured out. There's so many variables between the weather and tidal influences that really contribute. So multiple years of collecting data was essential to really doing and finding the major problems and then finding a solution for those problems. The other project that was really important was our watershed education program that was kicked off in 1991. We were able to get great grants from the Polaroid Foundation, from the Boston Foundation, from the EPA education um, opportunities to actually fund a school program that goes K through 12, where every student gets a subject matter that relates to the watershed, that's taught in the classroom by one of our staff and an intern. Teachers are trained, and then the kids go out into the field and actually do hands-on experiments, so they really get their hands dirty. One of the projects within that was the high school's Adopt-A-Watershed project where the kids went out into actual sub-watersheds and collected data similar to what we were doing on the river and sort of acting as scientists. It's been recognized by the state on numerous occasions as a really outstanding opportunity for students. My name is Deborah Weaver and I'm the current director of the Westport River Watershed Alliance. I hope that you've enjoyed learning about what a watershed is and how important it is for everyone to protect these special places. We've been doing that here for almost 45 years. No matter where you are in a watershed, you can be part of the pollution solution. The Westport River is a unique and beautiful estuary. 
Through the efforts of so many over the years and our efforts, it has remained unspoiled. With your help, we can continue to keep it clean and healthy. Roberta Flack once said, there's a river that flows through the lives of everyone. Please treasure your river as we treasure ours.